Hey everybody, and I'm glad you've joined me for our midweek Bible study uh, here at Crabtree Valley Baptist Church. As you're well aware, we are on pause still for our Wednesday night uh, prayer meeting and Bible study. We are meeting for worship at 11 o'clock each Sunday if you feel comfortable enough to come. If you don't, we understand that as well. You can join us by worshiping online at 11 o'clock on Sunday mornings. But on Wednesday night, we're still pausing, uh, just practicing social distancing and uh, just for a, a little longer till we can make sure the numbers are going down. And it looks like they're starting to do that, so that's good. So when our deacons meet again, the next time maybe we can go ahead and decide to uh, open back up on Wednesday night. Uh, we'll see and, and see what happens. But I'm glad that you've joined me this evening as we continue our look at the seven churches that are listed in the book of Revelation. Now, if you were with me on Sunday, with us on Sunday morning here as we worshiped, you know, we started this sermon series uh, talking about the church at Ephesus. And we talked about the fact that Jesus, as he wrote through John, uh, to these churches, there was a certain style that he wrote. He, he did a commendation. He told about what he liked about them. And then he told about what they were struggling with. And then he gave them the challenge of, of what they needed to do to continue ministering and being the church he's called us to be. And we talked on Sunday about the fact that Ephesus, while Jesus said he knew their deeds and they were working hard and they were making sure that people who were there were teaching the right things and believing the right things and weren't trying to lead the church in a, in a bad direction. While they were doing those good things, still there was something that they needed to work on. And, and Jesus said that they had lost their first love. In other words, they didn't have that same zeal. They didn't have that same excitement, that same energy uh, that they needed to continue on ministering. And so Jesus challenged them to think back to that time when they when they had that first love and what that was like and continue working in that. And we talked about the fact that as Crabtree Valley Baptist Church, as our church family, you know, we need to look at that and we need to think back to when we first accepted Christ or when we were first, you know, having that excitement and that zeal and do we still have it? And if not, what has caused that to happen? What has caused uh, the problem to take place. And so this evening, as we did Ephesus on Sunday, this evening we're going to be looking at the church of Philadelphia. Now the church at Philadelphia is mentioned in chapter 3, verses 7 through 13. You say, well, that's not the second one listed. No, the first four we're going to be doing on Sunday morning, and then the other ones we're going to be doing on Wednesday evening. So uh, tonight we're doing Philadelphia, and then next week we'll be um, Sardis, and then the next week will be Laodicea. But tonight we are looking at the book of uh, Revelation chapter 3, and I want to begin reading in verse 7. To the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, now this is Jesus talking to John as John is going to be sharing these letters with the churches. These are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David, what he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. I know your deeds. Now, once again, you remember, that's what he said about Ephesus. I know your deeds. In other words, what Jesus is saying is, I know what you're doing. I know the good work that you're doing. So Jesus says this, I know your deeds in verse 8. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have little strength, and, and here's a commendation that he gives. I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. I will make those who are of the synagogue of Satan, who claim to be Jews, though they are not but are liars, I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. Since you have kept my command to endure patiently, there's another commendation that Jesus gives the church of Philadelphia. I have, since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one 
will take your crown. The one who is victorious, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will they leave it. I will write on them the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God. And I will also write on them my new name. And then the challenge again, whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The story is told of a man who had a great opportunity that he missed. His friend took him for a ride one day way out into the country. They drove off the main road and, and drove through a grove of trees to a large uninhabited piece of land. A few horses were grazing and a couple of old shacks remained out on the land. The friend, whose name was Walter, stopped the car, got out, and started to describe with great vividness the wonderful things he was going to build on this property. He wanted his friend Arthur to get in on the ground floor of his plan. But Arthur thought to himself, who in the world is going to drive 25 miles for this crazy project? The logistics of the venture is staggering. And so Walter explained to his friend Arthur, I can handle the main project myself, but it will take all my money. But the land bordering it, where we're standing now, will in just a couple of years be jammed with hotels and restaurants and convention halls to accommodate the people who will come to spend their entire vacation here at my park. He continued, I want you to have the first chance at this surrounding acreage because in the next five years, it will increase in value significantly, several hundred times. What could I say? I knew he was wrong, Arthur tells the story. I knew that he had let this dream get the best of his common sense. So I mumbled something about money being tight and promised that I would look into it and to get back with him later on. Later on will be too late, said Walter. You better move in on it right now. And so Art Linkletter turned down the opportunity to buy up all the land that surrounded what was to become Disneyland. His friend, Walt Disney, tried to talk him into it, but Art thought he was crazy. You know, there are times in our lives when opportunities come along and and we see them as impossible or crazy or something we just really don't want to get, get into at that time. And, and so we fail to do it. Maybe we feel God leading us to do it, but we just feel like we can't do it because it just seems crazy. It seems impossible. It seems like something we shouldn't do. And so we fail to do it. And, and in, so we, in so doing, we miss a great opportunity. Well, just in this story I just told, there was a great opportunity for the Church of Philadelphia that was coming along or that had come along. And, and Walter, in talking to Art about this land, shared with Art what could really happen and the good things that could take place with this land. But Art didn't want to take part in it because he didn't believe in it. So he missed out on that. And there's so many times that we as churches, we miss out on blessings that God is wanting us to have and God is wanting us to experience, but we miss out on them because we just fail to take advantage of God's open door and God's special blessing for us. Well, as we look at this church of Philadelphia this evening, we see where Jesus is commending them. And if we look at the way we looked at the letter Sunday, Looking at the commendation, we, we notice what the commendation Jesus says is in verse 8. He says, I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. You have kept my word. In other words, you've stood strong for me. You've stood for me. You've not denied who I was. You've, you've always kept that faith and, and stayed strong. 
And that's something that I want to commend to you. You know, sometimes it seems like we're not doing things the way we should or, or we're messing up. But I think one of the things we can see from the Church of Philadelphia here is that it's important for us to stay strong and keep our faith. No matter what we go through, no matter how many struggles we go through or how many tough things we have to deal with in life, it's important for us to keep our faith and to stay strong and not to deny the name of Christ, but to, to lift up the name of Christ and hold it up before other people so that other people will see who we follow and who it is we love and, and who it is that we trust and we have faith in. And Jesus told the church at Philadelphia, I have seen your deeds and I know that even though you're weak, even though you're not strong, you still stand up and you still do not deny my name. And then there's another commendation here that I don't want us to miss. Verse 10, since you have kept my command to endure patiently. To endure patiently. Remember Sunday we talked about the church at Ephesus and one of the things Jesus liked about them is that they had perseverance. They worked hard. They kept going. They didn't give up. Well, Jesus says right here to the church of Philadelphia, you have kept my command to endure, which means to go on, to keep going, to not give up, patiently. That means things were tough, but they were patient with it. They didn't stop. They decided to keep their faith in God and to keep following him. So as far as the letter goes, there's the commendation that, that Jesus has for the church of Philadelphia. They kept the faith. They did not deny the name of Christ. They stayed strong and they stayed true to him. And as we look at maybe something that Jesus felt they needed to work on, it's almost like Jesus in this letter senses that there's an opportunity for them, but he's afraid they're going to miss out. Listen to what Jesus says to them. He says in verse um, 11, I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. The one who is victorious, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Now let's go back just a few verses to verse 8 again, where he says, I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. And it's an also an open door that only Jesus Christ can open. So what is Jesus talking about? The open door. Well, this open door that Jesus is talking about to the church at Philadelphia is the opportunity for them to share with people about the kingdom of God and salvation and see people coming to know Christ. You see, no matter what people say, Jesus Christ is the way and the truth and the life. The Bible tells us no man comes to the Father, to God, except through his Son, Jesus Christ. He is the open door. He is the only way to heaven. And no matter what anybody says, if somebody wants to accept Christ, all they have to do is ask for forgiveness, ask Jesus to come and live in, in their hearts. And nothing can keep Jesus from coming in. No one can keep Jesus from saving someone's life. No one can keep the Holy Spirit from taking someone who is lost and, and headed for eternal life without God and changing them into a person who is now headed for eternal life with God. That is the open door that Jesus is talking about. No one can shut that door. And, and just as no one can shut the door, there's no one else that can open the door for that to happen. Jesus is the only one who can open the door to the kingdom of God. He's the only one who can open the door to salvation. And so Jesus tells them, I'm giving you an opportunity. I'm giving you an opportunity at this open door. And we need to share that with people. We need people to know that they have the opportunity for hope and eternal life. And nothing can keep them from being saved other than themselves. That's the only person that can keep somebody from being saved. Now, the great thing 
about this open door to the kingdom of God is that it's not only for the church, but it's for the world. Yes, this letter was written to the church of Philadelphia, but it was written so as a challenge for them to take this message that Jesus has for them to the world. It wasn't for the church. The church is already saved. The church is already family of God. And so this open door, this kingdom of God, is for the world. It's for them to take part in. It's for them not to miss out on. Notice, you know, in John 3, 16, one of the greatest verses we know and one we, we've learned as children. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever, whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but will have eternal life. You see, the open door is not for the church. It's for the world. But it is for the church to take to the world. It's for the church to share to the world that there is an open door, there's an opportunity you have to accept Christ and have the promise of eternal life. What a great promise it is. But you see, church, that is our role. That is our job. That is our responsibility under the calling of Jesus Christ is to share with people that Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven and the only way to God and the only way to eternal life. So how do we do this? Well, we share it with people. But how do we share it? Well, we can share it through our words. Now that may be frightening to some people to think about going up to someone and sharing with them about what it means to be a Christian. It's one of the greatest gifts we can give to someone is a testimony and a witness for them to understand that Jesus Christ loves them. And Jesus Christ wants them to have eternal life. We don't know what people are missing in this world. We don't know what people's stories are. But the one thing we know as a church, the one thing we know as the family of God, is that one day Jesus Christ came into our hearts. One day we asked Jesus to come in and we took advantage of that open door. And we got salvation. And we got eternal life. And we got hope. We got peace. We got joy. All of those things because we took advantage of the open door that Jesus is talking about. So we can share our, our words with people and tell them what it means to be a Christian. What does it mean to know that Jesus Christ lives in your heart? What does it mean to know that one day when we are no longer on this earth, we will be with God forever? Be with friends and family and loved ones who knew Jesus as their Lord and Savior and have gone on to be with him. What does it mean to know that peace and to have that understanding? We need to share those words with people who need it. But there's another way we can share the plan of salvation or share about this open door to people, and that is through our actions. You've heard the phrase, actions speak louder than words. And I think that's one of the challenges the church has today is to show through our actions that we are Christians. Oh, great song that, that is in the hymn book of the Baptist faith says, they will know we are Christians by our love, by our love. They will know we are Christians by our love. So we have to ask ourselves, do people know we are Christians because we love people and we accept people and we minister to people and we help people and we do the things that people need because we're Christians, not because it's something we feel we're going to get paid for or something we're going to get this big, great benefit or reward for. No, we do it because we're Christians. Because Jesus Christ cared enough for us to die on the cross for our sins, we ought to be able to care for other people and love them. For God so loved the world. But can the church love the world? Well, Jesus was telling the church at Philadelphia, there's this open door of salvation, and it's your job, your responsibility to help people understand and come into that open door, and you can do it through telling people about me. You can do it through showing people about my love. And we have a great example in, in the Bible in 1 Corinthians 13. We hear that a lot of times at weddings. 1 Corinthians 13 says, if we speak... In the tongues of angels, we can have the gifts of prophecy. 
We can do a lot of different things. However, if we don't do them out of love, then it's not pleasing God. What are some of the things it says in Corinthians? It says it's a clinging cymbal or a clinging gong. It's just noise. It's just a racket. If we're not doing it for the right reason. I dare say that if we come to worship and we don't do it for the right reason, what are we getting out of it? Or if we come to Sunday school and we don't come for the right reason, what are, what are we getting out of it? If I bring the message and I do it and we do Bible studies, but I don't do it for the right reason, then what are we getting out of it? You see, the reason we should do things, and Jesus wanted the church at Philadelphia to understand, the reason we do things is because of love. And it's because of love from Jesus Christ that he showed us. Different ways that we can share Share his message of love. You see, that's why we use our gifts. That's why we use our abilities that God has given us. We use them to, to show others his love. Fixing things for people. Taking care of people. Whatever we do should be done for love. Now, one of the things we may hear people say when we are challenged to do these things for God is this. They may say, well, I'm but one person. What difference can I make in such a big world? That's a good question. You know, I talked about the old hymn, they will know we are Christians by love. There's another hymn that says, little is much when God is in it. You know, when we take what we have and when we offer it up to God and give it to God as, as our sacrifice and our abilities, and we say, God, take what I have, take what I can use, and give it to you, and use it. You remember the story of the boy in the feeding of the 5,000? Had very little, but he gave it up to be used, and God blessed it and multiplied it, and, and they had food left over. Well, the same thing is true for us as we use our abilities. If we take what little we feel we have, and we give it to God humbly, out of love for him, saying, God, I, I give you my abilities, because I believe you can bless it and multiply it and reach people through my abilities, then God will bless us. God will bless us. Notice what Jesus said to the church at Philadelphia in verse 11. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. The one who is victorious, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. You see, there's a reward for serving God. We don't do it to be rewarded, but we do it because we love God. But if we do it out of love for God, then he will reward us and he will take care of us. You know, Jesus even knew that the church at Philadelphia was little in their strength, as it said in verse 8. But he took that strength and he knew that strength could be used in a way to bless other people by showing them the open door and showing them how to have salvation. You know, we don't have to think real hard about people in the Bible who had very little to offer, but they offered it out of obedience and out of trust, and God took what they had and made it into something big and powerful. People like Rahab, the harlot who allowed herself to be used to hide the Israelite spies so they would not be caught. She offered up the little she had to be used by God. We read about a person by the name of David. David was the youngest sons of Jesse, but yet he was made king. He was, he was anointed king by God. He, he gave of what he had so that God could use him to be king. Not only was he a king, but he also defeated Goliath. You see, David offered up what he had to God and said, use it if you can. And God did. And God blessed him. We've learned about a person like uh, John, you know, his name's not given because it didn't, the boy's name is not given because it didn't matter. It was not important who the young man was. What was important was that he offered up to Jesus. He's the boy who offered up to Jesus the five loaves and two fish. And Jesus was able to make it feed over 5,000 men and women. And then we hear about the man by the name of Joseph. Joseph, who offered up the tomb he had to house the body of the Lord. 
for three days, and then he rose again. You see, Jesus' love for him and his love for Jesus is what compelled him to offer up that. What is it that compels us to serve God? What is it that compels us to come to worship? What is it that compels us to minister for God and to, to share with others what we have, our abilities? What, what is our main objective? Is our main objective to be seen by others and to have our name in, in lights? If so, then we're going to fail in that. Or is our main objective to share God's love? Is our main objective to show the open door that Jesus talks about with the Church of Philadelphia, that salvation experience that only they can get through Jesus Christ, is our main motivation to share the love of Christ with the world? If that's the case, then that should be the main objective. That's the reason we should do it, is because we love Christ and we want to do things to serve him. So what do we do when God gives us opportunities to witness through our actions or through our words for his glory? Do we follow his leadership out of love and obedience? Or do we say, I can't do it. I'm not big enough. We're not big enough. Or do we say, you know, Lord, I would be able to do that, but I'm more tired than I used to be and I just can't do it anymore. When we allow God to use us, people will indeed take notice. Jesus told the church at Philadelphia, if they would do what he said and would obey him, then those who lied about being in the faith, those who were in the synagogue of Satan, would fall at their feet because of what they did. You see, when we allow ourselves to be used by God for his glory, other people will take recognition of it. We have a great opportunity as a church. We have a great opportunity that God has given us as Crabtree Valley Baptist Church. The opportunity we have is to show others Jesus Christ. Show others his love. Show others what he can do for them, how he can love them. You see, when I read the church, the letter to the church at Philadelphia, I also read this as a letter to the church of Crabtree Valley Baptist Church, and that is, I have given you an open door. You know what it means to be saved. You, want it, you know what it means to ask forgiveness and have Jesus come and live in your heart. And now, because you know, you need to share it with others. And if you do, I will bless you. I will reward you. The letter to the church at Philadelphia, what was the commendation? The commendation was that they stayed strong and they didn't deny Christ. They used what strength they had to stay firm in their faith. What was their challenge? What was it that Jesus was bothered about? It was about the fact that there was an open door of salvation and he was afraid they were not going to take advantage of it and they were not going to use it. But they were going to let this opportunity pass by without taking advantage of it. Much like Art Linkletter did when Walt Disney talked to him. Commendation, what he was concerned about, and the challenge. The challenge is to share Jesus Christ with the world. It's what Jesus did. He was a sacrifice for the world, not for just a group of people, but for the whole world our challenge as well. We are to share Jesus Christ with the world through our words and through our actions. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Tonight as we close in prayer, I want us to remember those who are sick, those who are recovering, um, those who have been in the hospitals and are now recovering, those who are, are struggling maybe facing the end of life, families that are seeing loved ones uh, slowly slip away. I, I want us to pray for them and just remember so many people who are struggling at this time. Would you pray with me, please? 
God, we thank you for loving us. We thank you for being that passage to eternal life. And Lord, we know that no one can keep us from asking you into our hearts. Only we can keep ourselves from doing that. But we also know no one else can save us but you. And Lord, for those of us who have experienced that, we give you thanks and we ask that you would help us to share with others what it means to know Christ. Just like the Church of Philadelphia, we have an opportunity. Lord, help us not to waste it, but to use it and take advantage of it. And Lord, we lift up those tonight who are hurting, whether there's physical pain, mental pain, emotional pain. Father, we know there are those who have been in the hospitals and are now recuperating. And we pray that you will strengthen them and help them to feel better. We know there are those who will be having tests done or procedures done. And we pray that you will give them peace. Lord, we know there are those who are having to sit by the bedside of loved ones because they are declining. And Father, that's painful to watch, painful to see. And so, Lord, I pray right now that you will bring your spirit of comfort upon their lives and that peace that passes all understanding and help them to fill it in a special way. Lord, we thank you for our church family, for what it means to one another. And Lord, I pray that you will help us to grow stronger, that you will help us to hear your leadership and to follow it in obedience so that you can reward us and bless us the way that you want to. Now, God, lead us and guide us and give us a good week ahead. Bring us back to your house again on Sunday, for we ask it in your name. Amen. Thank you so much for joining me this evening.